This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Okay. Okay, good morning everyone and um, welcome to the 37th meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via video conference and our witnesses will also be briefing us via video conference. Um, the meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. Just to remind members to mute their tablet devices by pushing F4. And um, so moving on then to item number one, um, we have apologies from John Stewart and I think everybody else is with us. Yep, Chair, I think we have everybody else, yeah. Um, so item number two then is the draft minutes. There is a copy of the draft minutes um, from last week's meeting on the 14th of October at page four of your packs. Our members consent that those are an accurate reflection of the meeting. Great. Okay, item number three then, Chair's business. Um, we have received a query from Northern Ireland Tourism Alliance uh, regarding a new COVID restriction, seeking clarity on um, which indoor 
tourism att attractions can remain open. So are members um, content that we write to the executive office seeking um, that clarity? Yep. Thank you. Right. Yep. Okay. Then members moving on to item number four, which is a brief in this. Yeah. Chair, just um, <laughs> sorry, chair. Can you hear me? Okay, no, just on that item where you're contacting the executive office about um, a clear or clarification on some items. I wonder, could we uh, make a request for some clearance as well? I have been contacted by some uh, pubs that are seeking to do off license uh, during the, the close down, uh, and um, they have. They, they, they want to seek clearance if it's okay to do that because it's been indicated that they can't um, through Hospitality Ulster. And this is, you know, they're sitting here and they're trying to make some money during this close down. Surely they should be able to sell um, some drink, not anybody coming into their premises to actually purchase it or anything like that, but um, orders. Chair, we'll, we'll seek clarification yeah. on that. Um, I think there may be something from I, I think, the community. Yeah, I think there might be a check up on that as well. Thank you. Um, okay, then item number four is our briefing from Nilga on the role of local government in tourism strategies and the COVID-19 impact update. There is a clerk's memo at page four of your table papers. There is a briefing from Nilga on the impact of COVID-19 on local government at page nine of table papers, and then a briefing from Nilga and Solis um, on the role of local government in tourism strategies at page 15 of table papers. So um, can I welcome to the meeting and bring into the spotlight, please, um, Councillor Matt Garrett, who's the president of Nilga, and Donaghy, who is CEO of Mid and East Anthem Council, and Lisa O'Kane, who is programs manager of Nilga. Um, if I hand over to yourselves to make an opening statement and then um, we'll open it up to members for questions. Chair, could I just say that my son is a councillor on Arden North Downborough Council. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you. Oh, in that, okay. case, in, the, uh, in that case, could I say that my constituency office manager is a councillor in Belfast City Council? No, I'm thinking of that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> We're probably good on that, okay. I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Right, thanks, Chair. No problem, Gordon. Thank you. If I hand over to managers of Councillor in Mid and East Anton Council. Okay. <sighs> Done. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> let, let the morning develop, but we'll see. If it occurs, let us know. Um, if I hand over to yourself, then, Matt. <clears throat> thanks very much, Chair, uh, and I hope you can all hear me. Um, very good morning to you. Um, for any of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Councillor Matt Garrett. I'm currently the chair of NILGA, uh, which is the local government association that is representative of uh, all of the councils. I'm also a member of Belfast City Council as well for my sins. So thanks very much, first of all, uh, for your invitation this morning to address a committee at a time of uh, what can be considered as, as crisis. Uh, NILGA and Salas are firm partners. Uh, and we've jointly developed our submission paper, which you have had this morning uh, and has been shared with the committee. Um, we want to welcome the ongoing engagement with the committee. I know this isn't the first time, so we want to welcome that engagement uh, as it continues. And as all layers of government um, work together to ensure recovery and growth in our tourism sector. Um, you'll see in our submission papers the councils have played from the front in terms of supporting uh, the local tourism sector. We've outlined the range of initiatives and councils the councils are offering, um, and more detail on what the councils are offering are available on all of the councils' websites as well. Um, you'll see that all of the councils have demonstrated their responsiveness, adaptability, their innovation, their flexibility, and their local intelligence, um, ensuring that the, the tourism sector has access to mentoring, advice, and practical support at the same time as generating marketing campaigns to encourage visitors to come to our areas. Um, I want to take the opportunity to compliment the staff of all of the Council's tourism teams uh, who are working extremely tirelessly at this time. Um, you, you've already introduced, Chair, we have Lisa with us and we have Anne Donaghy, the CEO from uh, Mid and East Antrim. Uh, and at this point, I'd like, if I could, to hand over 
Tuyan, who's our solace representative, and my colleague Lisa is there as well uh, to answer any of the hard questions that you're going to give them. So, Chair, thank you very much, and over to Anne. Um, thank, thank you, uh, Matt, and thank you, Chair, for having us along today from local government to uh, present um, our, our position in relation to the impact of tourism, um, impact on tourism from COVID-19. Um, I suppose if I reflect back to 2018, we had uh, 5 million overnight trips, um, resulting in £926 million income to Northern Ireland. Um, and tourism accounted for 5% of the Northern Ireland uh, GDP and had the potential in the year that we're in for a £1 billion industry. Um, that was very encouraging, and certainly all of the 11 councils were contributing to that. So across the 11 councils, tourism has always and, and continued to have a huge um, contribution to our social, social inclusion and to our environmental um, provision across, across all of the, the, the councils. So um, I can just be very clear to say that COVID impact, it'll be no surprise, has had a severe uh, negative impact on our local uh, tourism economy right across the 11 councils. So um, we are facing losses of over uh, 600 million from overnight trips and a decrease of some 70% on the estimated 2019 spend. And that's in the region of 700 million. Um, tourism accounts for um, in and around 10% of the jobs in our economy. So it's about 65,000 jobs, and we are very aware that there is uh, 40,000 of those jobs at risk. So um, local government are very keen that we work with everyone that we need to work with to help to, to bring the U-shaped recovery back as uh, in a steady state recovery and to keep uh, to keep going and doing the positive things. And um, this morning, I would love the opportunity at some stage to discuss with the committee the um, the immediate and maybe the longer term um, requirements and contributions that local government can make to help uh, bring our tourism back to its former glory um, post COVID. Um, some of the things that we have um, that we've led up in local government is we have uh, initiated task force recovery groups and just very very briefly we have helped to lobby um, central government for rates relief and for different funding we have had bespoke marketing package certainly in my own council we put in twenty five thousand pounds to produce the rediscover mea and we did that with the tourism board we've had our own officers helping our tourism business is to fill out the application forms for grants. We've been trying our best to con instill consumer confidence in the staycation and getting people to stay three or four days in, within our own uh, uh, beautiful Northern Ireland. And we've also been looking at reskilling those people um, that are um, not going to have, unfortunately, a job in the tourism industry anymore. And we've been doing that with our local colleges. Um, we've been working with uh, access and PPE for tourism and certainly um, the manufacturing task force in Mid and East Antrim led the buy and supply portal that's now been used with um, Invest NI to give cheap local access to PPE. And then I suppose our, our approach to enforcement across local government has been one that is proactive and supportive, giving guidance and helping our, our tourism pr providers to, to, to get uh, to meet the requirements of COVID and to do things safely in, in the best way we can. In general, the industry has been very supportive, and very engaging, and um, but there are several challenges that, that we that we that we face. And I suppose for us uh, in local government, we believe that working together, we can have a steady state recovery model and that we can get back, but we need to keep clear communication, clear messaging and encourage the staycation and safety. So I'm um, very happy to take any, any questions, Chair. Hey, thank you very much for that. Um, and as I suppose Matt said at the beginning, this, this isn't the first time that, that we have engaged with, with Nilga and Solis and 
Um, I think it's really important that, that we continue to have that um, a conversation and, and that line of, um, of communication between ourselves because as we, as we are still um, dealing with the crisis and also moving forward and looking towards recovery, I think that to kind of joined up collaborative working between all levels of government is, is really, really important. Um, and I guess that, that would maybe be my, my first question to yourself. Um, how have you found that, that level of interaction and communication between, um, I suppose, different departments and um, local governments in terms of responding to the crisis um, and also you know, trying to, to deal with the many, many challenges that um, are faced by, by local government as well? Um, if if Matt's happy, I, I, I can answer this. But, um, so I, I suppose, um, like like every every public sector organisation and private, uh, it has been challenging. Um, but you know we've had uh, we've had feet on the ground from local government. You know, and it's you know the I suppose the need of. Of the tourism community um, has changed as we have went along. It, like initially, it started that they needed the arm around them to help them fill in the forms and to even understand what they had to do. Um, and you know, it's been a very, it's been a very um, unclear journey for them. And you know, local government, we've tried through our communications and if you like, you know, and through our campaigns to make it easier, to make it access to the information easier. In terms of work, the department, I like, I can't say uh, a, a good enough word on that. Like, you know, we've had the department, the, the department for the economy minister coming down to meet each of the council areas. Um, I can't account for what areas that she has been to, but I do know she was certainly in my area and had indicated that she was going to other areas. She met with local traders. She met with local tourism and listened to their concerns firsthand that was very reassuring about the connectivity between local and central government in terms of the grants you know local government are more than pleased to administrate the grants i will i will be saying very clearly that you know uh, local government has taken this work on and like we have no been given no additional resource or support from uh, for, in, in relation to the distribution of that but you know in the times that we're in that's not a priority certainly for my council um i i, I do think that there is a joint upness um I can give an example very clearly. I was in, in my council area. We were one of the first to have, uh, I suppose, a major incident in that we had a couple of food factories where basically they had to be closed in Cranswick and, and my park. And the the Department for Economy (DSC) everybody come round us. Um, but I do, I do feel strongly that it was coordinated very, very well by local government. Like we come in and got our feet on the ground. So I think there's a great, a, a great partnership working. It's like everything can be improved. But I have um, my first-hand experience with having um, the crisis, the local lockdown, um, or urban before anybody else, and now dealing with where we are. I, has been um, one that I can't complain about. I've learnt, uh, as is others, and what we've done in local government is um, all of the learning that was ex experienced through those incidents has been captured, shared, and um, we're moving forward. But I, I, I really would like the committee to know that local government, like we're up to do all that we can, you know, to support the tourism and you know hospitality as well because you know they're a huge part of of our future and a huge and they're hurting a lot they're hurting a lot and um it's about for me it's about giving them a pathway out i think they can deal with it easier whenever they know how it's going to unfold and for me the safest thing that certainly we're doing in in local government is talking about the u-shaped recovery so we're not saying you're going to bounce back, but we're saying there is a, a U-shaped recovery process that can be achieved. I hope I've answered your question, but happy to take a further one. Uh, could I add, add Chair, just in terms of the, the relationship between central and local government, if you don't mind? Um, 
Sure. I, I just think that it's worth putting on the record. I mean, our thanks to uh, central government for the support that has been shown up to this point. Uh, I said at the onset of this that I'm a local councillor in Belfast City Council, and uh, a lot of times we would uh, virtually meet in committees and receive reports on some of the engagement processes that have been going on in the background. But actually, being in the position that I'm in now, in terms of Chair Nilga, you see firsthand the engagement process that has that has went on between central government and and local government through Nilga and Salas, and the work that they're doing uh, along with yourselves is is second to none. The partnership panel has now been re-established after a four-year absence, um, which is very welcome, which brings together uh, all of the, the, the ministers along with um, SOLAS and local government to discuss the issues that, that are impacting them. And currently at the minute, obviously with COVID, the impact um, is great. And we've agreed that task and finish group that Anne has already mentioned um, in her opening remarks. Uh, we have seen uh, the, the minister for finance attending the NILGA Executive Committee uh, and engaging with uh, the NILGA Executive on what he's doing in terms of financially supporting the councils. And <clears throat> this should be seen, I suppose, uh, in a place where whenever the pandemic hit us, uh, local government rallied together, pulled together very quickly, done what needed to be done. And then obviously coming out the other side that is the financial constraints and what I have seen is um, central government listening very clearly to the needs of uh, local government, and I would encourage that to continue as we move forward. Um, thanks for that, and um, thanks for your response too, Jan. I, I, um, my own council area is Cosby Coast and Glen, so um, I'm, I'm very aware of the impact on, on tourism and, and also of the role that council has played in terms of, of supporting um, business in general, but also the tourism and the hospitality um, businesses. And also, the, I suppose, the challenge that there was there in respect of that between um, meeting the needs of residents and also trying to get some sort of um, summer season and um, have tourism um, like re reinvigorated to, to what degree that that could be done um, and I think that I, I guess going forward that's, that's going to continue to be a challenge as well um, and I, I suppose just a, in relation to um, some of the issues that I guess we're, we're facing in terms of, of reopening um, our businesses and trying to have the, um, the economy you know, begin to, to get back on its feet um, one of the, the key roles, I suppose, in relation to that is for council and the, that we have been grappling with to an extent in the committee is ar I was around enforcement. Um, and I, I was maybe wondering if you could give some feedback in relation to um, the experience that, that you've had in, in respect of enforcement and engaging with, with other um, agencies and levels of government in, in respect of that as well. So um, thank you, Chair, and um, I suppose I, I, I would say first and foremost that my background is an environmental health officer, so um, I, um, I believe there's a place for enforcement, but I suppose local government has for a long time, and I would endorse the, the approach of um, bringing people with us, education, supporting, guiding, and enforcement is always a, a, a last provision in terms of um, of where we are. Um, we have um, now happily um, received the, the, the guidance of what should or shouldn't be in a, a premises. Um, that has now been put into, into the regs. We are now uh, enforcing. I have to say in my own council area, we were, um, we were uh, um, visiting the premises before the regulations or before we had the permission to do so, just to give advice. And, uh, and people were very open to that and getting COVID ready. Um, in terms of enforcement, it is something that we have now got the powers to issue a prohibition notice after 48 hours, should someone not adhere to, to uh, the guidance that they've been given. Um, my experience over being over the last 25 years is that uh, a prohibition notice usually is enough for a business to to make the necessary improvement. Uh, however, if if that doesn't happen, then it will go through a process, a legal process. I certainly feel that 99.5% um, of our business community is doing their very, very best to meet and adhere to the, the COVID regulations and that 
um, the role, whilst it is enforcement, it is very much um, loaded towards education, support, and um, being there even as a shoulder and a reassurance. Um, I will say there has been issues raised in, in relation to the level, the number of environmental health officers that we have across uh, each council area in terms of being um, being enough to, to deliver the requirements. Um, the solution certainly that, that we have put in, and I know that other councils will be the same, is that um, we are using enforcement officers um, who will not necessarily have an environmental health uh, the, the enforcement powers of an environmental health officer, but um, and they are going out to carry out the enforcement inspections um, and to be the, the face of the council and to help the business. Um, but if some of the things are not in place um, when they arrive at the premises, then they contact the environmental health officer who then will take over. That's working extremely well. Um, and as I say, we have very much that uh, pro business helping them, um, but equally there is always that um, knowledge and respect between the businesses and the council that should things not be right, our first line is always to protect the public. Um, in relation to enforcement for uh, alcohol uh, licensed premises for alcohol, or indeed enforcement. Um, of groups that lies with the PSNI that was clarified in the last few weeks between Solus Nilga and um, PSNI and DFC. So there was quite a number of conversations around that. There is clarity now, and um, there's also it was also recommended that there would be uh, local arrangements, and uh, depending on the council area, um, they will have uh, various levels of, of working relationships with their local PSNI, and um, they have a memorandum of understanding. In my own council, um, we have a very strong working relationship with the local PSNI, and if uh, our, one of our officers find themselves in a, in a difficult position uh, whilst enforcing, then the they have the uh, access to ring PSNI, who will then uh, escort them uh, to, uh, up to the premises or ha come and help them. So the system is robust. The system has already been tried and tested. It just needed tweaked, um, and it needed tweaked with the improvement notice should, in order that we could react quicker if needed. In my view, um, I don't think I would be very. Um, very disappointed if we in my own council area had to issue very many improvement notices. I think that um, that would be a bit of a disappointment and um, that local government maybe hadn't got out and um, you know supported educated people um, and businesses enough. So um, I hope that answers me. But in summary, uh, education first, support first. Um, explanation, arm around people, just guiding them through what is a very fearful and very unsure time, and it's only as a last resort that we would uh, would even consider going down the enforcement route. And if we did, there is a get out of jail free card, and that you would get an improvement notice, which I think is a great a great thing to have. And that improvement notice gives the business forty eight hours to improve whatever needs to be improved. And if they do, then that's okay. And if they don't, then it will go on until the legal process. So I think it's fair, it's open, and it's transparent, and it is um, it, it's supportive of business. So you know, well done to Northern Ireland supporting their businesses in terms of uh, an enforcement role. Thank you. Um, thanks for that. And I, I suppose most of our our experience um, will be that the businesses really have stepped up and, and put in place measures and. <coughs> Um, and done what is necessary and taken very seriously the public health messages um, and it is in relation to that consumer confidence piece as well that, that people know that there is that, that level of um, enforcement there if it is required um, and that, that, that there is you know, that safety first um, approach being taken. Um, and I guess if I could just ask one final question for myself and then I'll hand over to other members. In relation to the, um, the Tourism uh, Recovery Steering Group uh, what has the, the interaction been with that um, in, the level, in relation to um, local government? I, I, I'm not sure if any of my colleagues want to answer, but I'm happy to. Um, is that okay, Lisa? And, yeah. So
So I suppose, um, you know, we are very aware of the regional group and, um, you know, again, I'm going to speak from a local experience. Um, uh, Mid East Antrim, we set up a tourism group many, many uh, weeks ago. Um, that is now, it was chaired initially by myself and now it's chaired by Colin Johnson of the of the Galgorm, who's an independent. We we liaised with um, t- um, Tourism Ireland, Tourism Northern Ireland. We liaised with um, Janice from the Hotel Federation, all of those people. And we then fed in, Colin Johnson sat on the regional team, so he fed that in from a local level. And that we found that really useful. Um, so back very beginning that was about what sort of PPE, what are we going to, how, how do we get PPE, how do we do that? Um, now it's more about like how do we sustain that, how do we support uh, employees that are coming off um, furlough and we have no job for them? What do we do? How do we reskill them? So that is, it's very connected at a local level. I know not every council has that, they've got all their own local arrangements, but in terms of that regional, um, I do know that there is quite a number of, um, of industry on it. I also know that they have minutes that are, 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 are to be distributed. Other than that, I will be honest to say I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure of where it's going after that. But I, I I do know of its existence, and I know that through through the industry that each council area is getting represented, and that's about all that I'm aware of. Um, I'm awaiting, I suppose, the the, the bigger plan for for tourism. I'm aware of the of the economy, the Department of the Economies five point plan. We've been following that right along and following the staycation, following that. It's good it's a good it's a good roadmap. And until we're, I suppose, in local government given anything different, we're on the things like the staycations, like gathering the local intelligence in your area, getting good accommodation officer, the nighttime economy, trying to build that, trying to look at, you know, what do we need to do in the in the immediate challenges and in the medium term and the long term in line with that Northern Ireland approach so that everybody's boat rises, you know, and certainly as we as we come out of the circuit breaker and the Republic of Ireland comes out of level five, you know, I think that the the early part of the, the of the new year will start to see hopefully people wanting to, to build the staycations again. So we need to be we need to stay strong and we need to through that regional team build the proposition now, build the consumer confidence, get the work done and most importantly keep the industry afloat um financially until uh, until the, the, the sun rises again for them. So really um I think that team have a lot of work to do, and I think that the, the best way to do it is through the local government lens, where we, we can just filter it both ways to and from the industry. Thank you. Chair, could I just add to that um, on the Tourism Recovery Group? I think there would be a concern um, from local government and the private sector that the Tourism Recovery Action Plan seems to have stalled in the department. Um, we understand it's undergoing due diligence for some time. Um, I think just given the situation of the crisis, there, there is a need to bring that forward urgently. There's £11 million pounds that's been allocated to tourism, and that has to be spent um, in year by the end of March. So the, the sector the sector as a whole would have concerns that that money isn't getting out fast enough and that the, the, the plan for, for all of Northern Ireland tourism is, hasn't been issued and activated. Thank you for that. We, we will follow up on, on that um, from today's meeting. Chair, we, we actually have a, a query in with the department on that because the Tourism Alliance also flagged the issue up. Um, so we've already asked the department for a time scale on due diligence on the trap. TRIP. Yes. Um, thanks for that, Peter. Um, if I could bring Sinead into the spotlight, please. Go ahead, Sinead. Good morning. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation this morning. And um, I, I really understand the value of uh, close engagement with the local government. And, and that has come to the fore, and I suppose, in the last few weeks within Derry City and Strabane District Council uh, and the pivotal role that they took 
in trying to drive down um, the transmission numbers in the city and region. And I think it has been a successful program of communication within Derry City and Strabane District Council. Uh, everybody got on board, um, local leaders from sporting fields, from, from um, culture and all backgrounds got on board uh, and did a massive campaign asking people to, to be, be very aware and abide by the, the rules and regulations. And we now thankfully see our numbers coming down. Um, and, and I think that that collective and unified approach um, between um, local and central government uh, is necessary. And I suppose I would be a bit critical in saying that I think some of our resources have been too centralized um, uh, and, uh, and be that within Stormont uh, and also uh, Westminster, because I think the boots on the ground and the people that are working in the cities and town centres actually really know where um, the heart is of their communities and where money and support is, um, is needed. So on, on that basis, do you see, do, 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 does Nilga see any other role for the local authorities going forward? Uh, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm even thinking of uh, track and trace. I think, you know, when we lock down and go into restrictions, it's incumbent upon us not to come out of the restrictions and revert back to what was normal beforehand. Um, you know, we know I hear on the ground here, people know where to, some of these transmissions are coming from and how, you know, to track and prevent them, et cetera, et cetera. Yet there doesn't seem to be a really concerted effort um, that the local government would be tasked with uh, with doing with doing that job as well. How how do how do you feel about um, get taking on extra um, extra duties and roles in relation to that type of um, that type of of, of uh, support? And then the other the other uh, issue that I want to raise um, that I'm raised. She said that the local government has taken on a role of uh, putting out some uh, business support. Um, for 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 the local businesses, uh, but haven't been given any extra funding, and based on the fact that you, you, your income is terribly um, terribly impacted because of the rates income, ha have you been working with uh, the Department for Communities to get more money into the local government so that they can provide high level services once they all get opened um, after the the current circuit break? Um. I, I maybe start off by saying, you know, I don't believe on a personal note, and I know my colleagues would be the same in Solus, that um, it is uh, that we could do track and trace. I think the public health agency is the place to do that. Um, I do think there is a lot of confusion out there in relation to track and trace. I think the app and then the public health agency and people aren't clear. Um, I'm certainly getting a lot of inquiries to council about, you know, I've, I've had an email, I've had a, a text on my app that I should say isolate, but I haven't had anything from the public health agency. What should I do? So I think there's more communications. People are confused. And I will be honest to say that, you know, it it, it needs unpicked a little bit in, in my view. Um, you know, because I, I have you know, I have elected members as well as staff who are confused about it. Um, I think that our resources are uh, for enforcement and education are best spent in environmental health, making sure that, that people are adhering to what they're supposed and giving the message out of, of confidence. And then on the other side, our tourism staff are best there to help the tourist business um, getting the, the, the proper grants being, you know, and helping those that are falling between the, 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 the grant um, the grant applications and, and helping them. So I don't think that it would be, um, I don't think it would be practically possible at this stage that local government could take on the track and trace, especially when the public health has has the role. Um, but if there was something that we could do to make it smoother, um, you know, I certainly Sinead, think that that would be a, a thing that we would consider, you know, um, like I have never in all of my 25 years of local government ever experienced anything like this. And, you know, we've went through all the emotions with our business tourism community from panic right through to excitement to get open again, disappointment. So there is a roller coaster of emotion in the middle of all of this as mm -hmm. well. 
So I think that we've got to, you know, allow the public health agency to do that. I think, in my opinion, that that should be clarified more. We will continue with the education and that. And I believe if public confidence is to be built, that has to be done through centre and local government jointly. Local government have a huge role in calming the, their local community. And, you know, I very often say that local government is like their hostess on the plane. You know, if we are not panicking, other people will stay calm as well. So, and the way we the way that we do that is by working with central government and making sure that we've got our bespoke marketing campaigns. We've got officers there to help people fill in forms to get the grants. We've got our skills development so whenever people are going to lose their job that there is something, a, a system sitting there that can support them to get skilled up in areas that they will get a job, helping them with, um, you know, and I fall back very much on the time whenever um, right bus went into administration and we had you know, nearly a thousand people with no jobs. All of those people got jobs again because, you know, that is what local government does best, help support people in times of need. So um, and going on to your second question, Sinead, um, you know, local government being supported um, with no funding. And, and, you know, we have administrated, for example, the town centre um, monies, which... We really welcome from DSC. I have to say that the departments have been good in, in getting the money down to us. Um, I believe that it's right that the, it's local it's local interpretation how it should be distributed because nobody knows Midlands Centrum like like my councillors and me. Um, I'm not that's a very respectful um, judgment that I think uh, DSC have made. DFI, you know, in fairness, the minister has been very clear with us. Um, there's a few things that we probably speed would be the, of the essence. So, um, you know, in terms of local government, uh, but I, I have to, I, I have nothing only to say that, um, you know, the money has come, we're distributing it, we're doing our best, but we, we haven't received any money in terms of directly for administrating it. That being said, the Minister of Finance has been very, very clear and very good in terms of giving us the funding for um, any losses. Now, where my worry comes is when that finishes, when that finishes, what do we do? And that's where my concern will come. And, you know, we're now facing where our staff furlough scheme has is now coming to an end as well. We're not entitled to the next the next provision made by uh, in relation to supporting staff. So we have a gap in local government. But um, so at a time whenever our citizens, our business, our tourism industry needs us more than ever, we are struggling with, um, you know, the provision of getting rates done and all those other things financially. So it's not really a direct answer, Sinead, but it's it's not there is no black and white on it. And I appreciate that um, and completely. Uh, just from your perspective, obviously we're trying to balance lives and livelihoods here um, uh, and we don't always get it right. Have you um, any observations that you could make if there was a further restrictions down the line, um, just from, 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 from what you observe within your community, within, um, with, within your council area, um, because you, you really know the hardship um, that has been uh, levelled at, at, at particularly, let's call it out, like the hospitality businesses yeah. and tourism uh, and uh, the sur surrounding supply chains. I, I know from Derry City Centre, there, there's nobody around. You know, there's very yeah. few people even out shopping um, and all of that. So even the businesses that are not mandated to close down, um, they've been put into a, 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 a lockdown as such. Um, so it's very, very difficult. Have you any suggestions from a local level how we would um, we would approach this in future? Well, uh, first of all, I endorse what you say, Sinead. Um, I can give you an example on that. You know, uh, in Ballymena, we had the local um, localised lockdown, if you want to call it lockdown or restrictions, um, for a week, and we had a thirty percent footfall in the town. People were scared. So I think the first thing is messaging is everything and i think you know the messaging has to protect 
tick fear out of uh, the messaging. Um, and I think sometimes, um, you know, if, I, if in terms of, of calming, you know, I think our job in local government is very much is to be that steady state people and to give reassurance and give reassurance to the public. So for, for certainly from our point of view, um, you know, we're going to be living this with this for a while and we can't decimate our our economy. Um, so we have got to find a new way, Sinead, of of um of being safe and yet keeping our businesses open because um I've already started to see some of them close. Okay. And that uh, you know, and that is a knock on fact for how we actually fund government and central government with the rate base. So um I you know I have a number of, of ideas. I, I I'm very happy to submit them to you. I would rather do that because some of them are probably quite wonderful. But um you know for me for me there has to for me, you know, we all talk about we went in this for a sprint. It's turned mm -hmm. out a marathon. I don't even think we have a half the marathon run. And you know People have talked about a two-year. We, I think, the lack of clarity: how long we're dealing with this and what's it going to do. How, my immediate concerns, like I can very clearly spell, like the immediate concerns that I have, and it's maybe not answering a direction here, but I think these are important. We have to together to put back to and secure regional access and local transport infrastructure. That is critical. You know, we need more, like the Department for the Economy. We need more from our for our ports, our airlines, our ferry operators. You know, you talked about the supply chain. Like, not only are we sitting, like I have Lauren Port, and not only am I sitting now with a supply chain issue with the ferries, and we knew we know it from the, the initial lockdown, supply chain was such a big issue. Now we're sitting with the Northern Ireland Protocol being implemented on the first of of January. So that is already starting to to rock confidence, but we need to make sure um, coming out the other end, if people can't get here as we lift restrictions, well, if they can't get here and we have no, our, our airlines and our ferry operators aren't up for it, then it doesn't matter how well I plan a four day staycation from across the UK and Republic of Ireland, it doesn't matter. People can't get here it's irrelevant we need to, i also think we need to look at you know how we can get direct financial support um so a lot of our smes don't fall under the scheme you know small like for example tour guides in the winter months you know there's other areas that are falling through and i think it would be i i would love to be able to identify those people and write them to you because there are there are people out there that have got nothing and um you know they're the people I worry about in, in tourism. Funded programs, you know, they need to be targeted. They need to be a quicker turnaround. You know, I suppose we need to get away of reducing the bureaucracy and making grants easier to apply for. I've helped a lot and my staff have helped a lot of businesses. And they wouldn't have, I'm, I'm, I'm not demeaning anybody, but, you know, if you're in a panic already and you're going, my business is going to close, and then you're faced with a huge form to fill in, it's... You just don't know what you should be putting in it. And I think we have got to also reduce the much funding for programmes going forward because the ability for some of these businesses to get much funding. I think, you know, we've got figures and I think this is a really important point for me. So I've got a figure out of the University of Ulster Economic Department who has predicted a 15.2% reduction in GVA in my area. But that's done on a across the board. However, I think each council needs to now look at what are you, what's your own market research and intelligence because there are areas in my council area that there won't be a fifteen. So some of my areas are are growing. So it's not all doom and gloom. Some of my businesses are growing and some are reducing. I'm in the middle of a couple of FDIs. People are still investing. So I think we've got to look at where are the growth sectors. We've got hydrogen. We've got all of those growth factors. So we need to really change the DVD. What's not working? And I'm doing a piece of work now to say my 15.2% will actually be a lot less because that has been right across the piece. But actually, some of them, some of the industries are doing well, and then the other one is marketing. You know, for me, we need a sustained staycation, short term, long term, and you know, I think that 
you know, whilst we're in the whilst we're in this curve part of um, the four weeks, you know, we need to be working now to make sure that people still feel confident to go away for a few days because, you know, the the, the messages are loud and they need to be, but we don't need them not loud that people then go after the four weeks, I ain't going anywhere. It's the winter time, I'm stuck in here and I'm staying in. And that's that's the balance that I think that we need to strike. But I'm happy to submit something, Sinead and Moni Taylor to, to the committee. And um, I think that there needs to be, whether it's that tourism alliance group or I can't remember the exact name or whoever it is, I think there needs to be a real serious 10 point plan of here's what we need to do and that it needs to be coming sooner rather than later and you know local government's very happy to put into that and to play our part but to me we're now in uh you know we're in recovery but we're now in the middle of recovery with a wee drag back to um reaction so we need to be careful that we don't get dragged back that far that we can't see a way out and, and, and there's there's an impasse I hope I've answered your question, Sinead. That's great. Thank you very much. And we would appreciate that, uh, uh, your suggestions and your paper. Thank you. No problem. Um, yeah, thanks for that. And uh, the, the committee is doing a mini inquiry around economic recovery. Um, and so we would welcome that submission. And I think Melga might be involved in that. Yeah, Chair, we'll, uh, we'll see who we've got responses from. We've sent out yes. a number of invitations. Thanks for that. Um, Gary, can I bring Gary into the spotlight, please? Thanks, Gina. Um, can I uh, first of all thank everyone for their presentation? Um, I, I, I too would like to uh, pay tribute and thank all of our uh, council staff uh, at all levels, particularly those in the front line who've been working uh, very tirelessly uh, over this past number of months. Um, my question is around um, obviously, we're in now another um, circuit breaker or mini lockdown or whatever you want to call it for the next uh, number of weeks another three weeks. Um, the first lockdown, we know it had a severe impact on our economy. The first lockdown, uh, you know, the, the purpose of that was obviously to uh, drive down the number of um, cases or infections, but also it gave us an opportunity to prepare our health service, uh, or we should have been preparing our health service in terms of uh, capacity. But also when it comes to our economy, um, th that we should have been obviously preparing for the economy to be reopening. And, and we talked in the previous time when Melga was in front of us around um, looking at opportunities in the town and city centres, maybe looking at innovative ways of doing things, pedestrian zones, all of that. I would like to hear your thoughts in terms of how how did that go? How was how did that preparation go? The doubt the help out scheme no, no doubt brought people in their town and city centres. But I want to know your thoughts in terms of in the next three weeks when we come out of this, uh, are these restrictions? Are we prepared to do things differently within our town and city centres? The Christmas period is a vitally important one for so many businesses. I just want to hear your thoughts in terms of what do we need to be doing to make sure that we can get um, into the Christmas period and make the most of it for our economy? Um, if, if my colleagues are happy, would you, do you want me to answer? Thank you. Um, I suppose, totally agree, like... You know, our, our traders and our economy and even our tourism um, uh, benefit greatly from, from the, the Christmas the Christmas period. And we're entering into that as we come out. I, I very much um, think that that's aligned with the end of the four week will be aligned with the kickstart. Um, you know, your question's very timely. I sat with my traders in um, Balamina yesterday and Traditionally, uh, to give you an example, traditionally, Balamina has a discount day where all uniquely all of the traders come together and have a discount day as the, as the Christmas lights come on. And there's people come from far and near to that. It was really, really successful every year. And they were uncertain. So, you know, the current communications has left a question mark. Can we do this or can we not? Because we will be encouraging people. People come, for example, from Donegal to look to come from, some people come over from Scotland for it. There's a 20% discount in some of these very boutique stores and people people travel to it. So, um, and they stay in the hotel. So really what they're saying is, if we're encouraging people to travel, are we breaking the essential travel? So, you know, what, what, what 
I suppose the conversations are on town centres is how do we do this and adhere to the essential travel? And um, I think the lack of clarity around what is essential and what's not. Um, and, you know, is it essential that people get out to do their Christmas shopping was the question I was asked yesterday. You know, and, and I'm going to be frank, I didn't have the answer, Gary. You know, I didn't have the answer because I wasn't certain. And, you know, I, I suppose um, every scenario throws up a question and there's no handbook to tell you how, how to do it. And I think what we've got to use we, is a common sense approach and a risk assessment. So for me, the way forward, and it maybe goes back to Sinead's question as well, Gary, I think the way forward with all of this is to do um, local risk assessments. You know, um, we're very good at risk assessments in local government, you know what I mean? And we're very good at saying, you know, what's the likelihood of something happening and what's the impact of something happening? You know, and if both are low, then, you know, then you can put in measures to to curb what the impact is, you know, and I think if you do a risk assessment against, you know, um, the health impacts versus the economy impacts, there's got to be some bigger piece of work. It's it's beyond my pay grade, but there has to be a bigger piece of work to say, you know, looking at risk, looking at likelihood and impact, and the risk around that in terms of economy versus. Um, you know, COVID versus uh, the future of our children, the future, like, you know, and, you know, the question was asked to me yesterday by the town centre people, like, there's not going to be a town here, you know, is that too high a price to pay? And those are questions that I can't give you answers to, Gary, but there are questions that are being asked at the town centre level. Now, I'd be very close to my town centre traders, so I hear I hear their, their concerns directly. And as I say, I met with Balamina Bid yesterday. Um, so Balamina Bid is, we're one of the only towns in, in Northern Ireland to have, uh, to, to raise extra taxes from our town centre in order to promote the town. And it has worked really well. That bid is due to come up now. We're waiting on legislation to be changed in line with England and Scotland and Wales where it can be extended out to June. But they're going. We're a bid town. That has worked for us well. But because of COVID now, how can you go out now and go out for a rebid or reballot whenever people are going? We don't even know whether we can get our Christmas period over. So I, unfortunately, I don't know the answers. But what I would say is, you know, what we don't want is everybody running out on Black Friday. Right, so it has to be managed because what's going to happen is like I I don't know but like I have two kids who will be waiting for uh, the big man to arrive and so you have to you have to plan and so there's something for me about um being able to do local risk assessments work with your traders put some responsibility onto I suppose local government share it with central government to say what is the practical common sense risk assessment approach for this town centre and how can we make it work and like i seen i seen an example the other day not to draw out any particular company but i i, I was I, taking my kids to mcdonald's and there were i'm sure like every mcdonald's in the country the queues are on real very very long queues so but what they were doing is they had two members of staff out at, at the drive-in putting people through a different zigzag system to to hold them off while others went through. And I thought immediately, well, why can't you do that in the town centre? Why can't you say, we're well, like get a risk assessment and say, oh, there's only a hundred people allowed in this town centre at a time. And it's like a bigger, a bigger McDonald's thing where you're saying, 10, 10 out, 10 in, and people just have to have patience. But I, like, there, I think we need to get more innovative and look around us. And certainly if Christmas doesn't, when we need it to happen, goes online, Gary, what the traders in Balamina are saying, a lot of us won't be here next year. So, Yeah, that, that, that's very much what I'm hearing as well. Um, just just a final point. Uh, well, I think we have to do, we have to send out the message, first of all, that, that Christmas isn't cancelled. I think that's the important thing. Uh, and totally that, that, you know, S -S Santa will come, hopefully, to us all. Uh, <laughs> and we need to encourage people to, to get out uh, and to the, to the shops. And we need to look at the data as well. You know, let's be honest, you know, we need to, you know, the data has just been published. We need to assess that, you know, and be honest about it and say to ourselves, 
are, are we doing the right thing here? Obviously, we want to protect people's health, but are we doing the right thing? Are we taking the right steps? And we have to be honest, you know, mistakes will no doubt be made, but we need to ensure that we don't kill off the economy in the process. Just a final point around the high streets task force. Obviously, you know, we'd heard that this, this high streets task force a number of months ago was established. Um, we had great hopes for it in terms of, you know, bringing uh, various areas together and, and having that sort of consistent approach. And I appreciate Anne, that, that, you know, you're one of the, the, um, the, the chief executives who are, are obviously proactive in terms of um, meeting with businesses. And I'm sure the, the, the other chief executives are as well. Um, but can you give us a feedback on the High Streets Task Force? Have you been involved in that? Or, um, you know, has there been any progress there at all? Well, maybe I can give you a build on this, but I, where, what I know about it, I, I don't know a lot, lot about it other than, um, you know, that it exists. I have very, very little information on it. Um, what, I, what I do know is that I have a local task force made up of the three towns, Carrick, Fergus, Balamine and Lauren, and those guys, I, I, I meet with them once a month and, um, and more if need be, but um, they are very blinded by it all. Um, we're trying to get the money out that was put down for the town centres. We need more, is what I would say, you know. And, you know, whether you, uh, whether we like it or not, town centres will never be the same again. But we need a nice start, Guy. I agree with you. We need to start and look at what, so we're, what we're doing now is we're locally trying to look at what else can we put in our town centres. So planning needs to get better at, at putting living in the town centre. We need to get life in the town centre because if we don't um, and we rely on traders only and on footfall only, it's going to reduce. So we're now looking at what leisure can we get and what other things can we get in uh, brave and quick to, to keep the town centre um, afloat because once a town centre becomes a ghost town, it's finished. It's finished. You can't rebuild it. You have to keep. So the big secret, in my view, is to keep the plate spinning on it and keep. So I think that the, that task force. I don't know what they're doing. To be honest, Gary, I have no, I have no link into it. But I think they need to start to look practically at. Um, what can they do to other alternative things to build the, the town centres up? And there are solutions out there, um, but, um, you know, that's really all I can say. And Lisa, you might know more about it. I personally don't know a lot about it. Yes, Gary, I'm pleased to say we actually just got an invitation at 6.30 last night um, from the Executive Office to start the engagement on the High Streets Task Force. And it does identify the need to work in partnership across government uh, and the private sector for that. So we, we'll be taking that up. Okay, that's that's a very timely question. Then. But I, I have to say, I'm uh, disappointed that um, well, the, the High Streets Task Force, in my opinion, has been set up now for quite some time, and uh, it is it's such an important uh, body. Obviously, in terms of pulling people together, in my opinion, there's an opportunity there. So hopefully, it'll be fruitful, and hopefully, they'll be much quicker um, at getting results out the other end than they have been organising the meeting. So, but thanks for that update. I appreciate that. And I think maybe that's something we should pick up with the executive office and ask for an update in relation to the high street task force because it has been a number of weeks since it was announced um, and it would be good to hear what progress there has been. Thanks for that. Um, Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much to, to Matt, Anne and Lisa for your presentation. And uh, we do appreciate it. And we do also appreciate the, all the good work that councillors have done right since the, the whole outbreak of COVID and the engagement with the community has been very much appreciated and the support given. Just a couple of quick questions. Most of the issues have been covered in, in detail. The grants that, that are now out and about for businesses, I do see some evidence of them working through in, within my own constituency in North Down. Has there been a good uptake in relation to applications for the, what I would call the business improvement grant that is uh, at, in progress at the moment would be my first question. The second one is going back on the, the point about the role of local government in the education, encouragement and enforcement. The big issue that um, people are talking about is the wearing of face coverings. Are councils getting actively involved in, in the education, the encouragement and enforcement 
in relation to the wearing of face coverings and do they have the resources to, to do something about it? It's very topical and it's also, I think, very important that something is done to support businesses out there. There is this issue about who is responsible, so I'd like some clarification on that. The last point is uh, a bit, I suppose, in relation to the Department of Economy, I understand have a bid in for £4 million. Some of us have been questioning the amount, but there's £4 million in for the promotion of tourism uh, in Northern Ireland and the Republic. And uh, I suppose the big objective is to try and promote staycations between now and the end of the financial year. Do you f still feel that that should be a priority for the department and, in fact, for the executive to spend substantial money in doing that? In light of all the ongoing issues with COVID, and I suppose we need to be positive and we need to be balanced in what we're doing, but we, we certainly have to plan for the future. Um, I, I, Chair Matt, Matt, with your permission, I, I, I'll start to answer them. So, um, the uptake of the grant has been a huge success um, and we have had more applications than we have had money. Uh, I suppose the, the, the people have been disappointed. Each council has, and I feel this is, this, is, this is right, but each council has decided how they're going to use it um, themselves. Some of them have given bigger grants for larger scales, others have given smaller grants to more businesses. And in my own area, we kept some of it to the side to do uh, like some public realm stuff as well. So everybody has done it differently administrative, but overwhelming success, a real boost to confidence in, in, in town centres and in that whole business community. Um, and also in terms of of the tourism grants, you know, our officers certainly were out helping to fill those in. So all of the money that's come down, I can't explain how grateful local businesses on the grounds ha ha has been. They've really been very grateful, and um, but they still worry, you know, what when this runs out, what happens, and that that's how it feels. But the, the gratitude certainly in Mid East Antrim has been very high, and um, but you know I do think that we need to look at how 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 we can be sustainable on it, you know, because we just can't keep handing out forever and a day, and you know people need to be to be I suppose uh, reskilled, coached back in, change their business model, get other ways of doing things to to help bring them back into 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 the a sustainable position. In terms of enforcement and education, well, you know, again, um, each council will do it differently, but certainly inf we are educating, we are encouraging face masks uh, in our own premises, but also across the, the community. Um, in terms of the enforcement of wearing face masks, I'm, I'm, I know that it's not council's role. I'm not sure, to be honest, that it is, um, to my knowledge, um, I'm a stand to be corrected, but I'm not sure um, who has a, a role of enforcement. I think it's more of about a community uh, contribution thing and very much about, you know, you need to, to do that. I know police, the PSNI have stopped people in the past to ask them. I am not aware of any enforcement figures around that, so I, I'm, I'm, I don't have the answer to that. But I certainly know that um, at the, whenever the beginning of the enforcement conversation started and it was muted, that local government may be asked to enforce dis, um, dispersion of cr crowds, etc. Local government were very much saying, no, we don't have the skills you know, uh, to, to go and disperse crowds. Neither would we have the skills to go up to someone on the street and say, um, sorry, you, you having your mask on. Um, you know, so we don't have the legislation for it. And certainly it's a very soft approach. It's, it's just the messaging, but we are not going out to anyone and saying, well, have you not got a mask on? I very much, as a mother of a child with a disability, I very much agree with the sunflower um, lanyon where people can wear that without feeling guilty. That is also a big issue, that people 
want to go into shops but can't because they feel guilty that other people might be looking. So there's a, a whole, it's, it's a very complicated, it's a very complicated, um, you know, uh, subject area. Um, and so enforcement, I, I don't have the answer. I suppose the, the, in, in relation to the four million pound that there is, you know, we absolutely uh, know the value of promoting staycation. And a staycation, like in, in, in Northern Ireland, we all, I suppose, culturally, we always would go, we'll go a day to Port Rush, we'll go a day to Bundorn, we'll go a day to, you know, the Causeway Coast, we'll go a day to wherever. And that's it. And you might stay in one night. So what we really need to change here is we need to change the approach that, um, we are going to stay for three or four days. Now, to do that, and uh, in my own area, we have got MEA staycation and all of that promotion. That took me working with that task force locally for three or four months, where you put together a package with all of all of the businesses, the tourism people in your area. So you let it out for people. You come to Middle East Antrim, right? You can you can stay. Here's your high, medium, or lower priced places you can stay. You can go to the Gobbins. You get ten percent if you do it through a package. You'll get ten percent reduction. You can go up the Causeway Coastal route. You can go here. Here's where you eat. Here's the thing. So you need to make it easy for people. So the money that they're proposing to spend, I very much think that that's that is. I would endorse that because without Putting people's minds have not been used to this, and like you know, you'll hear people say, "I'd love to go until Mid East Antrim, but what would you do there for four days?" So, the job of the Department for the Economy and the local councils is to say, "This is what you can do for four days, and this is you can actually have a really good family time, and uh, you know whether." Uh, whether you're in Derry, Straban, whether you're in Fermanagh, Oma, or whether you're in Belfast, or whether you're in Mid East Antrim, wherever you are, that, you know there's things, and maybe even between some of them. So I think it's about. I think money does need to be spent, and I do agree that it needs to be spent too with the Republic of Ireland. There needs to be a joint plan because people will go to Donegal, they will go, but equally, what we're seeing is those people. Are, have been locked down in, in, in level five now, and they want to go somewhere. And the amount of people that I have certainly know that went to Mid East Antrim over the last number of six or seven months that never were in it is huge from Republic of Ireland. And I'll just leave you with one example. Um, through the original, the first lockdown, we we had the farmers bash the drive in, and it was a, like it was. Um, something that we we didn't know how it was going to go, but you know we did it with all within the the co uh, within the public health guidance. Over half of the cars that come to that drive-in concert was from Republic of Ireland. So I think there's a huge market, and I think the beauty of Northern Ireland is understated. I think that there's so much that we can we have to offer. Our people are so friendly, so nice. I think we absolutely need to spend that money and really, really put together the packages and them in to the mindset of people. That would be my view. Okay. Obviously, North Down is a good place to visit as well, Anne. <laughs> by, by the way, yeah, and uh, the, the other thing, of course, is that, that any place has to be safe and hygienic, and people need an assurance that it is, especially in relation to accommodation. And I think, you know, perhaps more needs to be done to highlight that, and I know there are standards and you've set high standards, and I've been in places, and the extremely high standards are there, and give that confidence right from people arrive at the door. But I think getting that message out is highly important, and I think you know we all need to do what we can to to promote staycations and the, and the value of them. But well done, and keep up the good work. And thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Um, John. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your presentation thus far. Um, you had mentioned that you were an environmental officer uh, in a previous life. I, I used to be a chef, and obviously we, environmental officers and chefs had to interact with each other. Uh, but the, the, the important thing about environmental health officers is that they protected people's health. They, they went into to restaurants and hotels, and they ensured that uh, myself and others were carrying out their duties in, in a safe manner. So it, this brings me to the point I'm trying to make. There are, there are a small minority of businesses who are flagrantly disregarding COVID regulations. Um, so I would hope if 
one of your staff walked into one of those businesses, they wouldn't put their arm around them. <laughs> they shouldn't be, I know. Uh, they, they, they may want to carry out another action. So there is a balance to be got in terms of those businesses who are learning the process, who are genuinely misunderstanding what they have to do. But I, I do hope uh, across the Nilga uh, councils that where they encounter flagrant disregard for the regulations, enforcement is in place. And, and I, I can assure and confirm to you through the chair that, you know, if a business needs to be enforced, they will be enforced. Um, there are a few of them, but they do exist. And, um, you know, our, our environmental health officers would have no, um, basically, if they weren't doing what they're supposed to do. The thing I would say as well, John, is that, you know, our team, our environmental health team know the businesses. We know who, we know who will... You know, you get to know over the years all your businesses very well, and you get to know who's who, and you know, you 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 know who to you know where to put your resource. Let's put it like that. So, um, I give you an assurance that if if a business is not re um, meeting the requirement, they will be uh, they will be visited and they would be enforced if that's the if that's what we have to do. What I will say as well is. <clears throat> I have um, noticed so much an increase in public enforcement, um, as in the public continually are ringing in to the council. Now, on average, I would say we're getting somewhere between 20 to 30 calls per day now from the public saying, didn't like this, didn't see this, this happened, that happened. So <clears throat> I, I do think we need to continually encourage the public to be the eyes and ears as well. They're they're very, very vigilant and more so in, in the last number of months have become much more vigilant in terms of lifting the phone to say um, this um shop or company hasn't got this on another. So and we would follow all those complaints up across all of the councils. So hopefully yeah. that gives you some shame. No, that, that's great. I've actually noticed myself even in terms of the young constituency office and my own social media, I would get more and more people coming to me and saying uh, A, B or C shouldn't be happening in a, in a certain premises or wherever it may be. So uh, it is useful because the I want to come back to the tourism point then because the, the best way to get our tourism sector open again is if we can reduce and minimise the spread of this virus as much as possible. Then we can get our tourism up and going again. Uh, and like Gordon, I'm going to promote my own area. Uh, and I'm trying to get Gordon down. We were actually supposed to be on the shores of Loch Ney today. <laughs> Uh, I was looking forward to showing Gordon uh, Lachne, but uh, I, I do receive comments and complaints from some of the, of the tourism sector around the shores of Lachne that it is the, the forgotten jewel in the crown, as such that um, even from the, the tourist board, uh, seem to have the accusation would be that it's forgotten about from the tourist board. Obviously, the local councils are much more connected to, engaged with, uh, and quite literally on the ground with, with local businesses. Um, wh what would your views be in terms of how we could support more tourism in and around the shores and on Latinay as well? Well, John, the first thing I'll say, I would be, I come from your constituency, so I also know Latinay very well. So, um, and it's beautiful, uh, and isn't it? It, well, do you know what? It, it is a beautiful part of the world, and I have to say, and particularly the the part that I am lucky enough to live in, I, I couldn't I couldn't fault it. But um, what what I would say is that you know I I do think that you know if you look at tourism in Northern Ireland, uh, the focus have they've very much taken the model of you know what's these things called the destinations and, and destination approach where you know for example they'll they'll focus on the causeway coastal route a lot of the money but i think there is a huge opportunity with city deals or growth deals in terms of how we can use the growth deals to promote our tourism certainly you know i know that there's a number of tourism projects i know you mentioned uh, north down there's a there's a project there and in terms of you know of, in bangor and on all the rest through city deals so i think uh, it would be probably really uh, useful if um again if i could write back to the committee to say here are the here are the tourism projects that are in the city deals and the growth deals across northern ireland you know i certainly think even 
like I, I took a, a drive the other day to see the new leisure center. I wasn't, I wasn't in it, but I was so impressed the new leisure center down at the, in Craig Alvin at the lakes and the amount of people around it and it wasn't even open was, was really remarkable. So, um, I, I, I do think that we need to, to view tourism and um, leisure tourism is also a very important part of our future coming out of of COVID. I think that we sometimes think of tourism very traditionally of people coming, but we need to change our mindset because in the next, um, up to the next three years anyway, my focus in, in Middle East Antrim is going to be on the staycation to include um, the rest of the UK, Republic of Ireland, and that is, you know, and then anything, the, the, the predictions are from um, the university is that, you know, the, the, the market thereafter that will take three to five years. So I think we've got to focus on, you know, as a mother of two children, like I want to take my children to, to leisure, sports, um, tourism, that will draw people. And this is back to the point, John, We've got to spend money now on putting together a package, you know, where you're going. I can go. I can go and, and take a break in in Armagh for for three nights because none of us have ever thought like that. Do you know what I mean? We haven't thought that way. We've took a one night and maybe a, a push two nights, but nobody has ever said, "Right, you want to go to North Down? Here's the full package. Here's what you do." <laughs> <laughs> so, but what, what, what I'm saying is we need to spend money in, 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 in doing the thinking for people and within that thinking you're pushing the safety message the hygiene message you're pushing you can bring your family you can push all of that and certainly that to me is 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 the way to go but you can't do that without money and without innovation and without what are the needs of people now? People are people in, in the house. They have nowhere to go. You know, the you know the want the want to do things. They want to do things as a family now. So I think we've got to get through that tourism group. We've got to say, what's it going to look like for year one, year two, and year three? Because it will change. And um, so I, I don't know if I've answered your question or not, John. But certainly, I, I promote uh, I promote the, the Loch Ness um, tourism, um, and, and uh, as well, I think it's a beautiful a beautiful part of the world. Right? But we're very lucky. There is, you know, Northern Ireland as a whole is is all very like it's it's so different. It's so beautiful. And I have to say that whenever you link in with people from across the world like it's so highly thought of you know and we need to compete together as opposed to you know there's nothing to stop somebody coming to, from uh, from republic of ireland to come up and have a staycation and to travel a couple of places around you know where, be it the north coast be it the west wherever okay, so thank you thanks john Thank you, um, thank you very much for um, your presentation and your answers thus far. I think it's important that we understand the, the context. We now have seen the government's advice, and the government estimates that the hospitality lockdown, closures, restrictions, whatever you want to call them, will have an impact of between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 on the overall R figure. We have a situation where the lockdown of the beauty industry is expected to have a cumulative impact of 0 0.05 on the R figure. And most bizarrely, um, anecdotal reports of outbreaks linked to bars formed part of the advice being given to government ministers. Now, if the Health Committee is robust and determined in pursuing a health agenda, I think that the Economy Committee to be robust and determined in pursuing an economic agenda. Um, I met with a business owner on the Craiga Road, running a, a small cafe, and the look of utter dread on that person's face because of the struggle that they've been put under to try and keep their business going. And I am mindful of the fact that everyone that's taking part in this conversation will not be affected because we're all public sector workers. So we, we won't be affected by decisions made by government in connection to the productive side 
of the economy. And so I personally, I think the best recovery plan is finding a route to opening up as much of the economy as quickly as possible in order to generate income, including income that local government relies upon in the form of rates. Um, Gordon was very localised in his comments, so I'm going to be equally uh, parochial. Um, you know, obviously, I'm a lifelong resident of Belfast, though my wife is from Ballycarry, which I'm told is in Mid and East Antrim, but um, lifelong resident. Uh, lifelong resident of Belfast, and I'm mindful of the fact that I also spent 11 years in Belfast Council, city centre, and everything within sort of three miles, <coughs> a three mile radius of City Hall is the economic engine for that entire region. Um, I wonder, could you just talk to the sort of impact that the lockdown, uh, the restrictive measures rather, have had upon the generation of wealth from that part of Northern Ireland? I, I'm happy to comment, but maybe the councillor from Belfast, mm. you, uh, the president first, maybe? Yeah. Okay, Christopher, good to see you. Um, and 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 Miss from Belfast City Council. I thought I was going to get through this. I thought I was going to get through this entire meeting without having to mention Belfast. But there you go. I'm going to get me a new stamp in Belfast as well. Um, I mean, I mean, Christopher makes a point, and and obviously, no doubt, the pandemic has has caused uh, real concern. Uh, for local businesses in Belfast City Centre um, in terms of, of what it does. And it has had an impact, but uh, as Christopher will also know, the Belfast City Council are, are I suppose, engine drivers and trying to support businesses and support uh, anything that they need to do moving forward. Uh, one of the, the points that was made earlier on by uh, uh, one of the other contributors was talking about the impact on city centres and had impacts on people using their city centres and town centres. And I, I'm reminded of the, the uh, pre-mark fire, the pre-mark issue that happened in Belfast city centre, which actually made Belfast, forced Belfast uh, to start reimagining how they done business, started to reimagine how we supported businesses. Uh, and I think that there are good examples there uh, that, that Belfast have been part of. Uh, and I suppose re- uh, animating the city in terms of, of, of issues uh, currently as that exists at the minute. Obviously, with health concerns and people's uh, health, we have to be very clear about what we're doing. Anne makes a point earlier on about clear communication around all that we're doing uh, as a city to try and encourage people back in, in a very safe uh, and controlled way. And the same would be for the, the tourist sector, I suppose, as well in Belfast. You have to encourage people, but encourage people in a way which which doesn't frighten people. So we have to uh, do all that we can as a city, but people's health is key to this. And John makes a point earlier on, whenever the health situation uh, starts to improve, then the tourism sector no doubt will improve with that. And that would be the same for businesses and the same for others. And councils can play a key role in that in uh, supporting local businesses. The, the, the grant system that was mentioned earlier on, Belfast have been oversubscribed around the business grants. Um, they are getting phone calls on a day and daily basis. The, uh, the grants for uh, revitalization of our city centres has something that has been well taken up by local businesses as well. And it won't go without its, its obvious difficulties. I mean, even whenever we did uh, find ourselves in a situation around the pre-mark fire. There were difficulties there, even in terms of supporting businesses, um, supporting their longevity, supporting uh, how they traded in Belfast city centre. And that will be the same case for now. But, but Belfast as a council have very much been to the fore in terms of supporting those local businesses. As a councillor in Belfast city council, when I am contacted about a business, not even in Belfast City Centre. You talked about the Krieger Road there, wherever it may be in Belfast. If we are uh, contacted about issues relating to businesses and support that is needed by those count by the council, then it is a phone call, and then our offices are on and they are dealing with it 
very diligently and very quickly to try and support those businesses. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, Christopher, but I think you'll imagine that, that Belfast certainly are doing everything that they can to support business at this time. One of the, one of, one of the things that uh, I do I think will be a major blow is the loss of the Christmas market this year because that's something that draws tens of thousands of people into uh, the centre of the town. And I'm just wondering, uh, is there anything in place, Matt, the Council, anything planned in terms of trying to encourage people in during the Christmas period? Okay, well, we, we, we actually only got the indication uh, last week, as, as, as you know, around the Christmas market and then not being able to continue. And, and you'll know how, how busy the Christmas market is. So that obviously would have brought key health concerns about having people in, in that area around City Hall. Uh, some of the things that have been mooted in terms of Belfast moving forward around Christmas is how do we support the markets that are already in existence? How do we support the traders uh, in those areas to try and drive footfall uh, in the areas traditionally that, that are operating anyway on a daily and a weekly basis? Um, so it's about trying to drive that footfall where we can in a safe manner um, uh, and trying to support those businesses. But we will not see, I mean, you know yourself, Christopher, any day of the week, any hour of the day that you walk into Belfast while that Christmas market is on, it is absolutely ram full of people. And, and that would be a key concern around health. So I think that it is the right decision uh, in terms of it. It will have an impact, certainly, but let's try and support those other businesses, ban local, supporting local businesses, uh, supporting the high street where we can in a safe manner, uh, and supporting, for instance, those market traders that are already in existence around Belfast. I think St George's is a brilliant facility, and if there was actually, you know, I think that's a good idea in terms of using that which is already there. So if the council was to be organising some sort of events in around St George's or the other markets, I think that would be that would be uh, welcome. Um, <clears throat> just, <clears throat> excuse me, just one more general observation, and then I'm I'm done. I think it's it's a saying well put that you catch more flies with honey than vinegar, and I think. I agree exactly with what Anne said around the general approach to business should be around educating and informing and putting the arm around people because ultimately the economy is everything. Everything that we politicians get to sit and argue about how money should be spent. And I want I want play parks in parts of my uh, area. I want improvements to leisure facilities. I want uh, new pitches. All of that. All of that can only be done. If council, in, in this case, or government, in our case, has a strong rate space, and you only have a strong rate space if you have a strong economy, so I wouldn't want us to get into a situation. Of course, if there are flagrant and repeated breaches uh, of the rules, then people should be held accountable for that. But I think the business has suffered a great deal, particularly in the hospitality sector, and I, I wouldn't want us to get into a situation where representatives of the state were basically almost persecuting people. We should be helping people through this because ultimately they're the ones who are suffering because of the decisions that we are taking. Um, sure, um, if, I, if I may also comment on, um, I suppose, all of the questions that, that Christopher has posed to say, like, you know, um, Belfast City has suffered, all of the towns have suffered, I'm giving you a figure of roughly 30% drop in footfall. Um, I'm giving you a report where people, um, we are coming off furlough, where the tourism sector is very vulnerable to like a 40,000 uh, jobs. And, you know, those can't be recovered overnight. So for me, there's a couple of really, really important things that we need to think of in relation to the economy. And that is a collaborative approach to this staycation, how can we put the packages together? And I do endorse the money that is being uh, earmarked to be spent because it is going to be needed. I think we should be looking more about promoting and clusters. So we started to work in clusters in city deals and in growth deals. Why can we not work in similar clusters or different clusters for staycations and really get it on the map? Because it really doesn't matter it, it, like I think we need to get back to thinking Northern Ireland PLC here, and how can we actually, you know, put the GV get uh, 
damage limitation on the GBA. So there's something for me in, in, in starting to put the, the, the offers and the experiences together um, and, uh, and work. I really think that the recently, I think it was last week, Rural Tourism Experience Programme was launched by, uh, by uh, DERA really really welcome because it, it means that that the more outlying um council areas can see that that they're a part of the bigger tourism package obviously belfast has the whole has a huge pull and then after that we all have to to feed into into that for me the other big thing is the skills we now will have potential for a lot of people coming off furlough that need to be reskilled we, don't, we can't afford to lose the skills that we that we need for tourism. Before COVID, I was struggling to get skilled people in catering for our hotels in Balmina. I'm like, I don't know if it was like that in Balmina. What was it like in Belfast? So um, we we need to be careful. Plus, we've got um, you know quite a number of new. We need to focus um, our energies on the new on the new emerging opportunities. Even within tourism, there are emerging opportunities, and within uh, the economy, there are emerging opportunities. And I think, you know, one for me is is definitely the whole green energy, hydrogen, and all of that. But there are others, um, and then I think we need to really, really take a look across Northern Ireland. And again, I'm going to give you a list and if, I, if there's anything that the committee need after that I know that Solis and Nilga are always too only too keen to pull together whatever whatever information you need but I think it would be really useful exercise to say here's all here's all the city and growth deals and here's all the proposed tourism projects that will actually help to grow the economy the other one point there, there's this complementary fund I can hardly ever say the word but I've just managed to get it out and no more and there's a hundred million so and there, I, I honestly think that that, that money should be faster and quicker. Like it's, it, you know, that money should be used post COVID to really, to really help now get people back on their on their feet. Like you know, for me, uh, you know, we've talked about using it digitally. We've talked, but the process and around it, uh, and you know, I would encourage the departments to really start to work together to say, how can we get that 100 million pound on the ground to actually make a difference, to keep our town centers open, <clears throat> which is a critical, a critical key, key cog in our tourism offering. You know, our towns are lovely. You know, people love coming to our towns, you know, the mixture of different shops and the people and the buzz and, you know, so we can't afford to lose them. So those are a few things that I certainly think we need to start looking at now. And, you know, don't underestimate the, the city growth deals, but the money needs to flow faster. And we need to, to but I, I am true, true Solis and Nilga, we'll send you further information. Thank you. Um, Stuart. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll declare an interest. I'm a resident of Mid-East Antrim, and yes, it is beautiful. Um, Next year will probably be the single most challenging financial year for local government in Northern Ireland. Um, today's presentation is from a joint presentation from Nilga and Solus in respect of tourism. But you will both be required to work together to deliver uh, a rates package for people, uh, all of the rate pairs across Northern Ireland next year. That will be a very difficult task. Um, Rightly, citizens will be looking to see uh, what you're going to charge us and what you're going to deliver with the income that you make. How will tourism fit into that? And is there a risk that it will be squeezed out of other competing needs within your rates package next year? Um, I, I'm happy to start off on that. Um, the first thing, you're, you're quite right. Um, the rate setting process will be... Um, more challenging than, than ever before. Um, I uh, we are working very closely with our colleagues in DFI, and you know we've had good clarity from the minister there in relation to what what we will and will not be supported on, and um, I think that that's good. But um, also we have put a request in that is going between DF, DFC and uh, DFI in relation to. Um, the capitalisation of some of the some areas of our work that could normally be defined as revenue in order to help us, and we've also asked that 
our rate setting process would be delayed so that it could coincide more with the um with the other side of the rate set by central government and uh, they were 52 percent of the rates made up from from central government and the other 48 from local government and very much um year on year um the process the timing of the process means that local government have to have their rates struck before the the 14th of february um and that means that it is unlikely that we will ever that we would know what the central government rate increase would be. So um, we're trying to get that pushed out so that we're more uh, we we understand better what the rate bill on on the doorstep will be, because you know with um with any rate setting process, a council can say, oh we we're only going to, we're going to put it up by one percent, but when it reaches the doorstep, it could actually be up by two percent if if central government decide to put it up more. So we're trying to get something because we're very aware that we are in a place where there's greater need. Um, less money for people, and um, and that's always a very difficult equation to, to balance. However, it can be, you know, and we have got to make it work. It's not going to be acceptable, certainly in in any of the councils, uh, let alone my own, that we that we come in with a, a, a high rate or and a high not only domestic but business rate. People will not be able to shoulder that. So. Um, I think it's a mixture of looking at um, at, at how, how we cut the cloth. Now, I, I can only go back to the experience over and over over the years past in terms of recession, depression, and you know I always look back to a very simple example um, in the nineteen fifties when um, the, the the slice pan was invented, and that was in uh, I suppose in in a. a pressure point where the housewife had to make and it was a housewife back then and so just in terms of um the the the, the reading said the housewife had to make the loaf go further so they invented they got innovated and, and invented the slice palm so i very much think that we have to be this apply the slice pan test to local government and to get innovative and in how we do things and um make it make it work um in terms of tourism i absolutely think we have to invest and certainly my own council chamber are saying what are the things that we need to invest in order to grow the future now it might not it might not bring the money in next year but it might the following and the following so we're going we're having to take a more medium term look at now i will be honest it is very difficult for local councillors who have a capital plan that's rolling to see some of their projects maybe will not will be delayed or, or maybe even taken off the capital plan. That is a difficult place for 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 a local council, and it requires an, a lot of maturity in terms of of all of the parties and the officers and and a real trust and honesty working through it. I have to say that will be a very difficult process. Councils have already started well into their rates process earlier than normal because. There's going to be a lot of talk. It's easy whenever councils um, councils love to open things, but they're not so fussed on on closing or reducing or pulling back, and you know, and, and that can be that can be difficult. So I think hard choices have to be made. But tourism is one where you know it is you know it's one of those um, sectors. I talked about growth sectors, and you know. Um, Certainly, in the uh, in, in, in the council in Mid East Antrim Council, we're having to look at what do we invest in terms of the growth sectors for the future. Because our job as councillors and as councils uh, and Milgans go with is, is to build a sustainable future. And sometimes we've got to to, to take a, 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 an investment on something. And I believe that tourism is hugely important because the one thing that we as humans like to do is to interact with people and is to get away. And people have, you know, people people haven't had that opportunity. So I do believe the staycation will be something that will grow our economy faster than we think. And I do think that the U-shape will continue and that it will, it will come back again. It, um, so... I'm not sure, Stuart, if that answers or not, but um, you know, I share I share the, the challenge with you. I know that it will be difficult. But you know, local government 
uh, has never has never laid down at anything. We will we will get through it, and we'll work together to get things through. And you know, innovation is already starting to fall through in terms of where we are. You'll see the announcement there this week where we've claimed back the the, the VAT on, on leather. There's a few other things. So we're we're starting to really try to push how our money is used and what what way we can make the public's money uh, work better for the future. So hopefully that answers you, Stuart. Thank you. Sure. Maybe if, if you don't mind, could I add a wee bit to what Anne has already said? Um, and she's covered everything uh, really well in terms of, of the rate base. Um, and I suppose for me to go back to what I had said earlier on was the support that has been shown so far by central government in terms of supporting councils. I think that that, that can't be lost on us, the, the appreciation that's been um, received by councils in terms of that support. And councils have stepped up and they have delivered where they have needed to. But the rate issue is one that is live, that is nigh, and it's one that is uh, on the lips of everyone in councils and our chief executives and through discussions with NILGA. There isn't a meeting that I'm not going into where the first thing on the agenda is, is the issue around rates moving forward and how we mitigate potentially against the loss in those rates. Um, and £71 million has been awarded up to this point. £71 million from central government, the first tranche of 20.3, the second one of uh, 40.1 million, um, and then 11 million came from DEER in terms of waste management. All key services that need to be delivered in council have been supported by uh, that support package. But the rates as we move forward is one that certainly uh, we need to look at. So whenever the partnership panel, which was instigated again uh, after four years, get up and running, one of the first issues on the agenda was obviously COVID recovery, which included the rate moving forward. Uh, and so that's why that uh, task and finish group was, was organised or is being worked through at the minute so that there can be a co-design co-design between central government and local councils about how they do things moving forward financially. How they, you know, how does the rate look moving forward? Uh, councils in terms of their borrowing powers, the financial models for councils moving forward, all of that will be key part of the discussion. Um, and, and it will have an impact in the short term. Obviously, we have concerns about that, which is why we would like to see that support continue. But this task and finish group, the importance of that, I think, is key to local councils in terms of that joined up uh, working approach. And, and as we strike the rate and as councils set their budgets and as they get their rates in, tourism has to be a key part of that in terms of growth moving forward. Yes, we want to retain our open spaces, our services, you know, improve people's health and mental well-being and all of that. And that is key. We need to do that. But we need to support that sector as well. Uh, but I think that that can only be done through that co-design mechanism where as councils and SALAS and NILGA come together um, and, and look at how we develop a financial model that is sustainable moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Matt. Um, Claire, can we bring Claire into the spotlight, please? <coughs> Uh, good morning, everyone, and, and thank you for your presentations. Uh, really interesting. Um, I suppose if I'm, I, I was to make uh, comments um, around my experience and my engagement with local council uh, recently, it, it has been very positive. Um, you know that. I suppose from the outset, uh, local council themselves were finding it difficult to understand their role within the the response to COVID nineteen. But I think, you know, six to nine months on, you know, they they certainly have um, uh, established that role. And certainly around the new restrictions, you know, that they're understanding that they will be the people who will be enforcing the new restrictions. So I find it useful from a from a constituency casework perspective that um, we will, you know, uh, speak with with local council officers, particularly in environmental health, to understand their interpretation of the regulations because ultimately they will be enforcing it and um, i suppose on that point um you know there's a couple of criticisms over the weekend not of council but of the restrictions and you know again people have already discussed this in, insofar as the communications around it and because the council councils are responsible for enforcing in in certain areas there was almost a suggestion that there was a lack of consistency across northern ireland where some council areas um were enforcing uh, or interpreting and then enforcing particular parts of the restrictions and maybe some other council areas were not. And that does create an animosity, not just amongst the business community, but also uh, amongst the, the public. 
so I suppose um, as a, an organisation that tries to help um, join up uh, the councils across Northern Ireland, it'd be interesting to, to know how you are sharing ideas and sharing interpretation, particularly of the restrictions, to ensure that we do have this consistent message. And I do absolutely accept that that has to be led from the Northern Ireland Executive. That's not happening, but you know that that's a debate we have. We will continue to have, no doubt. But you know, certainly, I think you're playing a role there, where where you're joining up those dots, and I and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. And given the time left, I'm going to very quickly just make comments in relation to what Anne has said around um, almost having that one stop shop for the tourism opportunities. Across Northern Ireland, and I, I'm not sure if it still exists, but there used to be a great uh, Discovery and I website, albeit a bit dated, which would have looked at each county within Northern Ireland or each council area, and it would have uh, highlighted, you know, what you could visit within those areas, so whether it was in County London or County Londonderry. Um, and, and I, you know, I remember years ago finding that useful. But if we were to create something like that now, it does have to be mindful of the platforms that people use: Instagram, influencers, you know. Um, I went to Glenarf, um, I think it's Mid East um, there a couple of weeks ago, stunning, I'd never been there before, posted it on my own social media and, you know, I, I did see an awful lot of people then decided to, you know, to take them, themselves there themselves uh, after that, I'm not saying it was because of me, but, you know, I think it's those sorts of things that we need to almost inspire people to do. And the other comment around tourism too I would make is that certainly in the short term we seem to be moving away more from events tourism towards um almost natural landscape tourism and i, and I don't you know know how useful that is insofar as the economy and um, but you know how do we um i suppose exploit that but again having that balance of being covid safe you know um over the weekend we had great weather and everybody seemed to flock to the north coast and you know in in one sense that's good because people are getting out and they're enjoying the weather and they're not going into enclosed spaces where the spread does seem to be happening but equally the public are quite nervous around that and i'm getting a lot of constituents saying to me um you know is, is this safe and maybe that's a communications message too because maybe it is safe but you know, I think it's to, to remove that fear and animosity with the public because, you know, you made a comment as well earlier that people are, are calling in to, to the council or they're calling into constituency offices, um, almost making complaints about other members of the public. Yes, that helps in so far as it doesn't create an anger and an animosity amongst the general public, because where I'm quite concerned is that there is a real palpable anger that exists. And I wouldn't want to see the public doing that to each other, because ultimately, I think that anger comes from a bad government message and um you know i think how we we improve that is by government getting their finger out and actually doing their job to to um communicate to the public a bit more effectively than they are doing um so a lot of different things kind of jumped all over the place there so i'd appreciate your your comments and thoughts thank you claire, claire thank thank you very much for your questions and I, ha I have to say that um you know in terms of what you said if there's different interpretations i certainly would bring that back through to the solace mill the table but also just to assure you that the chief executives and solace have all been have all been engaged in in the regulations with the department with tao with the department and that has been discussed with with our partners in psni who's doing what in terms of the practical on the ground we have a thing called the ehm which is Environmental Health Northern Ireland, and there's a representative senior from each of the 11 councils sit on that in terms of talking about how they share an experience, how they actually do the job. And then the expectation is, is that that's filtered down through each council. But I will, after this meeting, raise that up through Nilga and, and Solis through to the HNI to make sure that they, they sharpen the pencil on that one and make sure that if there's any gaps that we, that we can close it. Um, I, you know, in terms of the, the clusters that, that we spoke about, um, clustering the packages, I like the word that you used. We've got to inspire people. You know, we've got to inspire them to see that they can stay somewhere for three or four nights locally and have a have a good holiday and have good things to do. You know, and events are are something that is. Um, going to be uh, not about for the short term, but it doesn't stop us having leisure, um, leisure events. And, you know, there is, it is a, it's a tricky situation to get people to come stay, eat in that place and, and spend their money, but also not have some of the things that we would have been traditionally used to to spend their money on. And we have to get that balance. And I think that that's why that regional team is needed really, really badly to, to get that that balance in there. Um, I suppose 
I, I'm not sure if that answers all your questions, but um, I, I, I suppose, and in, in, in maybe closing out, not, I think that it's really important that local government puts in to and um, contributes through the NILGA invite and um, Solis invite into that um, tourism team to, to really shape this with Tourism NI and Tourism Ireland as well. We have a very good relationship between Tourism Northern Ireland and Tourism Ireland and, and how we can uh, build the packages. Thanks, Claire. You're still on mute, Claire, but I think you're just saying thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you all very much for that briefing. It was really, really useful. Um, and I think that there's a few things there that we'll be following yeah. up with, um, with the department and also in terms of communicating with yourselves in relation to our um, inquiries. So we, we will be back in touch with you in relation to that. And um, so thanks again for Thank being you. with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Now. Um, members, as you are aware, we have to be out of this room by 12 o'clock. Um, oh. So we are proposing that we deal with the rest of the agenda via correspondence. Um, members will um, be asked to respond before the end of the week. We can have all of the items week. Is that okay? Marvellous. Dead all. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Claire, if you want to press the red button. Thank you. Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30. This is Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 